On this episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show, we talk about some of the ways that we determine if an athlete is ready to return to competition after a lower extremity injury like an ACL reconstruction. The Ask Mike Reynolds Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Round Show. We're up at Champion PT and Performance in Boston. Lenny McCrina, Mike Scaduto, Dave Tilly, Dan Pope. I don't know if I've ever said it that way. That's good. That might be. That was a different one. We're all we're all here for you, answering your questions and and really anything related to PT, fitness, sports performance, the business side, you know, social media side, you know, anything. We're happy to help. Lots of great questions coming in. Come to MikeRound.com and, uh, and click on that podcast <laughs> link um, and uh, ask us anything, anything, even about K Bomb's um, awful facial hair. Any anything you guys want to ask us. About. It's good. So, uh, what do we got? So, Andrew K. Baum, worst facial hair of all time, Kirsch Baum from Oakland University, which has nothing to do with California, is here with us today. He's asking us some great it's questions. Hair with us. It's hair with us. Hair. hair. It's hair with us. I do say hair weird as a Bostonian. Hair. 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 That's, that's, a, that's a tough word for me. That's a tough one, though. We have Adam Pizow. Dow. Pizow. Pachink. <laughs> pachink. <laughs> what action goes with pachink? pachink. Like, like throwing a, a penny? Or a teacup or something. Yeah, exactly. You had something like in your hand. A penny? You had something. I actually can. I, I, so now we're going to talk about what's in our head when we say because I literally have like, you know, like dry ice, like smoke, like pizzazz. Mine was the like mine was like cowboy spit tank. I can see that. What was yours? I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I got Batman. Mine was shooting an airsoft gun off of a tin can. Yeah, look at that. Pretty wow. good. Pretty, it's quite specific. And then everybody's favorite, Brian Wiggs. Winkler from University of Delaware. Take it off. Who's, who's got this one? Winks. Do it up, Winks. All right, Sean from Michigan. Gentlemen and Lenny. I've always. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Am I not a guy? No, yeah, no. Or you're not a gentleman. Not sure. Right. Not sure. Now, do you, do you that think was amazing. Gentle, <laughs> do you think because he wants to ask like Lenny more so this question, or do you think he was kind of putting you down? I don't know. I don't know. I'm going away. It's when good. you go back to Michigan, yeah. that's where you Oakland University is. Fine, fine, Sean. Fine, Sean. Yeah. Like, time out. Time out. Like Oakland University is in Michigan. Like that doesn't even ring a bell. That's like it. Yeah. I just know it's not in California, but I, I can't believe it's in Michigan. That's crazy. But, all right. Sorry. All right, gentlemen and Lenny, I have always found it challenging returning my lower extremity injuries to competition. Understanding that there is always inherent risk with any sport, how do you determine an athlete's, athlete is truly ready? Are there specific functional tests you utilize, i.e. Y balance test, single leg hop, single leg box jump? Ah, okay, now I see why he called out Lenny. You've seen Lenny <laughs> argue with Tim Hewitt on Twitter. I see it, <laughs> I get it. What's up, Tim? Um, but Tim. Like, yeah, per, that's uh, interesting, all right, well. Tim's listening. Yeah, so, uh, good, <laughs> I, good question, so like, you know, I, I, how do we, you know, what is it? It's more like, how do we return them or how do we know they're ready for competition? Mm, yeah. So Len, I know you've been putting a bunch of work on this. I texted him this morning and said, get ready, because I knew he was gonna, <laughs> I knew he was gonna you know, be ready for this question. But like, there's tons of research out there on return to play after lower extremity injury. So I think this is a big question. Let's spend some time talking about this one and your guys' experience, what you found. But Len, enlighten us. Right. Like, what, what, what's the current state it of research? It is a huge challenge. And uh, there's a bunch of different camps out there. And, and you talk to Tim Hewitt, you talk to other people. Um, that I kind of respect in, in the what the world sports world, but so it's kind of respect. I kind of because I, I don't always agree with them. No, I'm kidding. Um, it, you know, the 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 traditional are going to be your hop test, your isokinetic test, your your isometric uh, handheld dynamo dynamometer test. Um, uh, there's going to be a seated hop. How many repetitions you can do? I've seen that that's out there, and I think they all have a a piece, but we're missing something because our retail rates are so high, and you look deep into the research and that's going to be his in-service is going to be the return to play aspect and uh, it's all over the place you cannot be just sold on on hop tests because if you dive a little deeper the validity of the test and are they truly telling us if they have a leg symmetry symmetry index so LSI that you're going to see in the research of 90 percent or more is that truly telling us that they're ready to return to sport and the research is saying no because the quality of the move is not good despite the the quantity of the move if they can jump a certain distance side to and compare it side to side 
I think you're comparing, say the left knee was involved and you're comparing it to the right, that right knee has gone through six to nine months of relative atrophy and trying to build that right knee up uh, after a left knee ACL reconstruction. So we're comparing left to right, but that right is still not their baseline. Their baseline was just prior to the injury or just a few days after the injury. So that was a study that came out of Delaware that Lynn Snyder Mackle put out uh, that showed that if, you're, if you use some traditional tests and then you try to compare to people that, are, that we use tests for that have had an ACL injury, not surgery, and then look at their baseline strength on their uninvolved side, you're gonna see that those people who we try to use traditional tests don't pass the criteria to return. So uh, because we're comparing it to a side that's just not strong, it, it, it's not as strong as it was prior to the injury. The non-dominant side. The non-dominant right. side, yeah. And we've, we've established that we're perfectly content with being 90% of that. Why on earth is right. that acceptable, right. by the way? Now, this isn't like a high school history exam, like we're 90% <laughs> still an A. 90% sucks. Right. 90% of the other leg's not good, yeah. especially when the other leg's weak. So maybe that, that's part of our problem. I, yeah. So I, I don't want to oversimplify this. Does it, is it, I, the, the more, I, everything comes down to going more simple, right? We do talk about this every day here on how everything is getting too fancy and being simple. Is it, is everybody just failing these functional tests because they're not strong enough? Because it's, we know with ACL literature and research, there's prolonged weakness. We know that the weakness correlates to poor functional outcomes. It, it correlates to poor uh, functional movement tasks, right. right? And poor biomechanics with, with stuff like landing and running and cutting and stuff like that. Is it just as simple as people aren't strong enough? I, I right? think like, that's one huge aspect is our inability to get people six to nine months out of a surgery and to be able to continually rehab them and get them strong and doing the correct things, not just doing a wall sit with a ball behind their back. Like, that's awesome for four weeks out of surgery. I've never done it with a ball behind my back. Oh, yeah, man. Do you do that? Do you do it behind your back? Every oh, Wednesday. <laughs> that's your I just had somebody the other day. It's one A. One A. That adds some stability to the wall squat. Yeah, I don't know. I just had somebody the other day. That was one of the things he was doing. So, I mean, it's, it's, and I used to do it. Trust me. That was, I was, Back in the day, that was a go-to exercise, but if you are six months out, you should be doing you know, pretty powerful uh, squats and deadlifts and, and weighted lunges and, and multiple variations of lunges and different angles and, and high-level plyometrics and, and, and you know, looking at their landing technique and you know, maybe using a force plate. We have a force plate here that we use. Uh, that I try to use, and they look at people as how much ground reaction uh, force they're producing, comparing it side to side. And so, I, to answer your question, for me personally, I don't have a set standard right now, and this is one of my goals coming up is to come up with something better because what we have is not uh, it's not good, it's not appropriate. Our retail rates are too high, and it's kind of one of my my passions of coming out for the you know in the, in the short term. And, and is it is it going to be more than they went through an appropriate rehab progression? Right, and they're strong. Because we uh, use I mean, that criteria for our upper body injuries. Yeah, I guess so there's got to be know, some neuromuscular I, balance. But I know. Still, like, yeah. you're going to have poor balance if you're not strong. Mm -hmm. It's like you, strength is the foundation. You can't have, you, you know, you can't stabilize without strength. Yeah. Because you're too weak. To, why am I sitting so close to you? I don't know. Like, <laughs> you're almost poking the eye. Like, <laughs> <it's laughs> but like, yeah, you know what I mean. Like, so, I, I, it's like the foundational component that we're missing. And and, and I, I, there's two things we're finding. One, re, I guess there's more than two things. I'm mean, gonna go through them real quick in my head because it's just coming to me. But like, one is we do a terrible job with late rehab. Right? Everybody's doing straight leg raises and whatever weird ball sits Lenny, Lenny was describing before. They're doing that for way too long. Right? So that's one. We do a terrible job doing advanced strength. Two is like, do we really think that insurance is going to cover more than you getting back to walking? Right. right? And you want to get back to a sport, you have to train. You have to either get with a gym or get with an advanced PT place that knows how to do advanced training. We're getting there. But three, and I think this is the curveball, is we're starting to see different people with reflexive inhibition and this like weird inhibition. We used to blame it all 100% on pain and swelling from the surgery, right? But I'm sure we've all dealt with a certain po percentage of our population that has no swelling, didn't have pain, and was just struggling to contract that quad at like four weeks, for example. I'm not saying like six months down the road, but what happens to that person six, seven, eight months down the road when something's up with their neurological system on how they can control that strength? Right? Maybe it's not just a pure that we're not loading it well. Maybe there is a reflexive inhibition from the injury. 
So for us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to more, like we've always been big fans of like neuromuscular electrical stimulation, but we're trying to use more biofeedback. Now we finally have a nice biofeedback market on, on uh, a device on the market, the M trigger, which we've been using here, but it's about getting volitional control, not just superimposing neuromuscular stim, but getting the right control of the, the entire muscle. So it's super interesting with that, but we, I know you guys had some thoughts. What do you, what, what do you guys think? I think you guys covered really well. I think a lot of times we don't think of the specific demands of the sport enough, like our oh, hop test, like that's perfect for basketball players, soccer, hockey, like all these sports that have completely different aspects you have to master. We're like, oh, hop test is going to cover all that stuff. I think the strength is huge, but I think one of the things that we don't really do well as a profession is get people prepared, like you had said. But the other part is like, if you have a sport that's practicing two, three, four hours per day, is an hour in the gym going to be enough to train that person? Like even if you're squatting, deadlifting, lunging, running, all that stuff, change direction drills, is that going to be enough to do three hours? You know, like that's a pretty big gap. Maybe some of the professional organizations are doing that a little bit better, but I would say the majority of physical therapy clinics, even the ones that are doing well, they're still not necessarily preparing that athlete to the specific demands as well as they could. You know? Yeah, those are, I think that's amazing. And you're, that's going to be your yeah. world a lot because you have such big training. That's hours. where I was going, yeah. I, I, that's an amazing point, Dan, too, that we often forget here because what we're finding with re-injuries and even probably the original injuries, they tend to happen in fatigue states. Right. You know, if you're starting at 90% <laughs> of the other leg, which is already at 80% of what it should be, and I don't even know what that equates to, but it sucks, right? And you're in that position, like, like, and then you fatigue out because you're two hours into practice. So, sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Those are two things that I've learned a ton about and I've seen, in addition to, I mean, studying under you guys and you learn all the basic stuff, but I think that the concept of fatigue is, is really prominent in the research right now in terms of the acute local muscular fatigue that happens with energy systems, whereas you're playing in a 60 to 90 minute match and no one ever even talked to you about training in aerobic capacity to when you get back to sport in that six to 12 month window, that's part of what you should be doing is building someone's general robustness, building someone's general capacity. Whether you're in a sport like I am where it's 90 seconds of a lower body glycolytic flooding event, super fatiguing, it's super hard to control landings when you're at that high, high level or you're at minute 96 in a soccer match because there's overtime and you cut and you pivot and you blow your leg out at the end, right? So I think like the, the global concept of fatigue is where a lot of the acute to chronic workload ratios and that, you know, U curve of protect, uh, protective fitness is super important because that is where people end up in their routine. And you can't build that in the clinic in a half hour session, yeah. but you can build a strength program. You can build extra workload. You can build a, a slow reintroduction to their sports because that's what I see in, in errors that I've made in the past. Someone's like, no pain, does your functional test, looks pretty good. I wanna play soccer, I'm going back to practice for four hours. Knee starts to get cranky out of nowhere. It's maybe not a, a blowout, but patellar tendon, cartilage stuff starts to come up. So I think understanding that research of really knowing energy systems of what their demand is for their sport, gymnastics versus a soccer player, and then also understanding that educating and communication and having trust and rapport with someone's like, listen, I know you feel great, it's nine months out, but you cannot hit fifth gear right now or we're gonna have some serious issues. Yeah, right. all but, good points. So, so let's put it all together then. So look, should you do stuff like hop test? I mean, why balance, all those things? I mean, I, I think they're great, personally with me, I think they're great ways of showing you that you may not be ready. Right, you know what I mean? I think they're good, good ways of doing it. I'm, I think most all of them are gonna correlate to weakness. They're gonna to correlate to issues with them. So you have to have an appropriate rehab progression. You have to have advanced loading. You have to do those things. And then you should be able to pass those tests. We also need to figure out in our profession, so what do we do for the people that don't pass? Because you know what we're doing right now? Still clearing them to play. Am I wrong? Like, you, they, they, you, you know, you fail the things. We have a baseline. Your, you know, your, your, your biodex score is like really low. And they're like, well, congrats. It's, it's seven months, eight months, nine months. You know, you get to return to play now, and like, well, what, you know, why do we do that? You know, it doesn't make sense. And looking at that study, I think it was BJSM that said like for every month out after six was twelve percent reduction, and it's probably because they have another four weeks of strength and another four weeks of fatigue work. It's, work, it's another not four weeks. time, right? There's exactly. not, there's nothing happening with time other than they're getting their strength. Back. The, the, those three to eight months or three to six months, sorry, is probably just that they're getting super, super fit in the right environment. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. That, it's a Grindham study, uh, in, I think it was 2016, I think, that showed that the longer you can wait, the more time you can get up to nine months. Yeah, you're not just laying get, around for right, three months. Right, to get stronger, <laughs> the retail rate, your chance of retail rate goes down. So Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So I, th I think that's our focus. I think that's what we need to go on. I mean, the only thing I would add is, is how we kind of talk to our, our patient in this process. Like, mm. when you're in rehab, and even if you're in late stage rehab, like, you're not even cleared to train with your teammates. Like, you're not even practicing, like, the... the players that you're going to be competing against. So how on earth could we go from that to um, clearing you to play in a game where you're, you're competing against people who have been practicing for a while? So I think it's like late stage rehab, 
you're cleared to train like with your team and then from there we decide when you go back to play. It's still going to be a process, yeah, right? Exactly. And then what's that process? It'll work yeah. a little bit. <laughs> but like, we do it in throwing really well, yeah. right? You never just like, all right, yeah, pitch tomorrow. Yeah. Congrats. And you're like, no, it's like a freaking gymnast. Throw, start throwing yeah. slap downs, and then you go to bullpen. It's right. like so logical. Like it just doesn't seem that way for, for an ACL injury. Yeah, we get, we, I think we got to do a better job with that late phase stuff and transitioning to that. I mean, like we we, we have our we have our ACL like jog fairly quickly. We're not against jogging, you know, pretty quick depending on the person, the situation. People as early as eight weeks, sometimes twelve weeks, like they're jogging in there, right? It's not necessarily the end of the world to do that because it's not you know super stressful necessarily. Maybe we start these things earlier while they're still building it, so we're building some energy systems, we're building some capacity of like you know the body to handle that workload that they're going to need in a few months. Um, yeah, we're going to do a better job, and then not just handing them over to the coach, like Mike said, just like you know saying like, all right, he's not cleared for two hours of practice, you know, like that seems crazy. You know? Um, so good. So I mean, obviously, you know, some interesting tips, right? I think, you know, I, I think we're much more to learn. I, I think we're qu it's quite silly to think that like a special like test that we can do is going to be the end all be all here. So you have to put it all together and see what really matters. And I think that's how we determine how you return to play. You know, and like, we do it like with baseball, we do it all the time. We had a kid this week cleared to throw with by his doctor, and we we're like, oh great, I'm glad orthopedically the inside of your elbow is cleared to throw but you are not cleared to throw there's nothing about you that's ready to throw other than your surgical procedure is past its healing time point right so that person gets it and they slow down they just listen to what we say but if a doctor clears them to go back from ACL they expect to play tomorrow right well we've got a big game next weekend I want to play tomorrow and, and we don't have this several month progression so I think we could do a better job I mean that's I think that's a good 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 way to answer this question I think this would be a good resource of an episode for people in the future so uh, thanks again great question um, head to mikeround.com click on that link for the podcast and you can ask us questions fill out that nice form if we get some more big ones like this too we'll, we'll spend the time and we spend a little extra time answering this question because I think it's an important topic so thanks so much we'll see you guys on the next episode